It's the real news. I'm Aaron Matzik. Is refusing to share your password with authorities a jailable offense? That question hangs over a case about to go to trial in Britain. Mohamed Rabani is the international director of the group's CAGE, which helps people impacted by British anti-terrorism legislation. Last year, Rabani flew into London's Heathrow Airport on his way back from a trip abroad, where he was investigating claims of U.S. torture. Rabani was arrested after refusing to hand over the password to his laptop. He has been charged under Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act, which gives British law enforcement wide powers to search travelers at ports of entry. Cage is known for challenging Britain's anti-terror laws, and now Rabani is about to do so as a defendant. Mohamed Rabani joins me now, International Director of CAGE. Mohamed, welcome. Aaron, thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us. Uh, let's start off with your case about to go to trial uh, later on this month. Yeah, that's right. In about a week's time, um, on the 25th of September, I'm due to appear at the Magistrates Court here in, in London in the UK. Um, to deny the charges that have been made against me. And essentially, it revolves around a password. So it all began in November last year when I was on my way back from a cage investigation mission to the Middle East. And uh, upon landing at Heathrow Airport here in, 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 in London, um, I was put through a uh, process which comes under, broadly speaking, terrorism powers which are granted to border police called Schedule 7. And um, in the course of basically four or five hours, I tried to reason with the police that um, I can't give up my passwords to my phone and my laptop, which was what they were after. And I said that if you give me an opportunity, all I need to do is secure the permission of, um, in particular, one individual whose who's, um, case that we're working on, um, who is a survivor of torture, uh, 12 years of um, torture abuse, and but also many other clients. Um, and I was trying to explain that if you give me permission to get their um, uh, go ahead and consent, then I can give you my passwords. But before then, um, I need to protect that trust and confidentiality. So in the end, what happened is they arrested me and I'm now, um, I was later charged. And now, of course, I'm, I'll be on trial in, in a week's time. Um, trying to explain to the court how I, I, I'm not guilty of a crime and I'm, I'm doing what any other professional would have done in my place. Did they give you any uh, grounds at the time for why they wanted to look at your laptop? And under these laws, are they even required to? Uh, the answer is no. There, there's no requirement. In fact, uh, to stop a person under Schedule 7 powers, um, uh, your listeners may, may be uh, surprised to know that um, there's even no suspicion required. So the threshold is so, so low. There, in fact, there, there is no threshold. I mean, there's no suspicion. So someone can just pick you out of, of, of the line and they don't have to provide a reason why they picked you out. Um, so uh, that's the main problem with this power. And it's been operating in the UK for 17 years, and which makes it a power which is not consistent with what we in the UK call the rule of law or due process um, rights. Secondly, um, everything that comes after that, um, there's no reason required. So my laptop phone um, can be confiscated, can be, well, you can be forced to um, give up your PIN codes and passwords. You don't have the right to remain silent. Uh, your fingerprints can be taken, your DNA can be taken, and you can be strip searched. And you can be held for six hours, um, treated like a criminal. All of that data can be put up, uh, copied and uploaded to databases where probably um, there's data of you know, convicted criminals like murderers, rapists and paedophiles, even though you've not been actually accused of any crime or even suspected of one. Hmm. Now, the obvious question here is, for me, is, is the, are these powers used across the board on every demographic or are they specifically targeted at demographics like yours, people with Muslim or Arabic sounding names? Sure, that's always the danger, isn't it? And what we've um, done at CAGE is we've been documenting and investigating not just Schedule 7, but actually the way that all anti-terror and national security policies have been operating 
and the way they've been impacting on the lives of ordinary people. And what we found is, um, firstly, the statistics connected to Schedule 7 were only um, disclosed from the year 2009 onwards. So that means nine years' worth of statistics we don't even know. And in that period, we had the Afghanistan war, we had the Iraq war, we had um, several uh, political um, acts of terrorism, political violence, um, including the 7-7 bombings, the Madrid bombings, meaning that was a period when there was a lot of people that were being stopped, searched, detained. Since 2009, anyway, the picture that we can see is, according to one study done by Cambridge University, they, they managed to track down people who'd been stopped under Schedule 7. And what they found is that 88% of people who were stopped under this power um, self-identified as Muslim. So that's a huge number, huge number. On average, each year, we have 50,000 people that are being um, stopped, detained, searched, and what we call digitally digital strip searches. That's what they've been subjected to. Uh, so 50,000 people each year, if you add it up, that's a huge number of British citizens who are just coming back from a holiday or business or wherever they've gone to, and they come back to uh, 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 sort of uh, to be greeted like uh, criminals. Hmm. So you mentioned that this has been going on for 17 years uh, to a lot of people. I believe since 2009, the number is, is over 400,000. Now, your case is... Uh, bringing attention to this issue, but I'm wondering is where was the attention before? Have uh, civil rights advocates been challenging this in years prior? Yeah, this is actually uh, one of the disappointments. Um, and I'm speaking from the perspective of being uh, someone who's been involved in legal and civil liberties work for a number of years now. I'm also speaking as a member of the uh, Muslim community here in the UK and probably other minority and marginalized communities would probably feel the same. Um, 17 years is a long time. And I think upon reflection, there's only two things that I can really um, think of that, that has led to this law still being in place. And one of them is, a, it's to do with the public psyche that has been um, conditioned to almost switch off any rational thought when the word terrorism is invoked. So what the British public have been convinced of is that these powers are necessary to stop terrorists from coming into the UK and bombing us um, to pieces. Of course, the reality is only five people were arrested last year out of 18,000 um, stop and searches at the border. So clearly all those 18,000 people were innocent and they were just people going about their business and only five were um, thought to be involved in some sort of criminality. And of those five, by the way, one of them was me. And obviously, I'm not involved in terrorism. I'm not being accused of terrorism. I'm, I'm being accused of not handing over my password. So you only have four people. So what we, so this is, this is one, one of the problems why this has um, uh, continued for 17 years, um, that there has not been a debate. There has not been a real effort to try and understand, you know, yes, we need to protect national security. Nobody's going to argue against that. But let's use an intelligent, measured, a proportionate response and let's not have this sledgehammer approach of you know thousands and thousands of people being picked up and detained and searched and the second problem we have is i think there's been what we what we were hoping and we expect is is more from the human rights community um, these are organizations and, and and figures who are who have a mandate to investigate and throw a light on some of these abuses especially when it affects uh, marginalized and minority uh, communities who don't have the same access and voice in society. So sadly, I think that th there's there's a lot of work that could have been done, should be done, because um, it's such a clear violation of due process, and, and it shouldn't have been allowed to continue um, this long. Hmm. You know, the uh, dynamics you're describing there in Britain have a lot of parallels to the climate here in the U.S. since 9-11 as well. And on that front, let me ask you, just this week, the ACLU filed a court challenge uh, to similar searches, to similar warrantless searches of phones and laptops at the border here in the U.S. Uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, we um, are very, very happy to see that. We welcome um, ACLU's challenge. It's a very strong challenge, and so that's my first thought on it. Um, secondly is what it indicates is a growing trend, it seems, 
especially within Western nations, to develop more and more intrusive um, powers um, operating at borders. And, um, um, and and that's a very worrying, worrying thing. I mean, passwords and digital devices um, in the modern sort of modern times that we live in, they are almost like a key to the front door of your home and your office. Because using that digital key, you can gain access to pretty much everything about a person, both their personal and professional lives. And what the ACLU challenge does is try to question that, you know, there shouldn't be a power that allows border officials to just gain access to people's lives, personal and professional, without proper safeguards where there needs to be some evidence brought against that person, a case made against that person, you know, um, and then obviously um, they, they can make the case and try and access their devices. But right now, as it stands, um, I think the issues are very, very similar. That which the ACLU case is highlighting and that which we here at CAGE are trying to also um, do is to, to, to just question that this, these powers need to be actually brought in line with modern technological advances, which actually means everybody's life is online and, and you need to respect that privacy. And it's not um, that, you know, the more access you get to people's data, the more you're going to actually stop. Um, acts of political violence. Um, there's no correlation whatsoever. So, so, so in summary, I think it's a very uh, important development, and I think um, hopefully it will pave the way to a, to a real uh, sensible debate, and some of these laws can be actually changed. So, finally, Mohammed, as we wrap, uh, your trial is coming up later this month. Can you give us uh, a little preview of what possible sentence you're facing and the case you're going to make? both to the court and going forward to the public on this issue? Sure, sure. Um, the offence that I've allegedly committed um, carries a three-month prison, prison sentence. So um, we'll be arguing to the court that um, I, I didn't commit the offence. Um, I'm being accused of deliberately uh, frustrating a search by police. And all I'll be saying is that um, it wasn't a deliberate frustration. It was actually... Uh, a, a dilemma which, um, if there was a very reasonable, sensible approach taken, um, it wouldn't be construed as a criminal offence. So um, that's what we will be saying, and we are quite confident that the law, the technical aspects of the law are on our side, and the court will recognise that I'm actually innocent of any wrongdoing, and hopefully um, we'll get an acquittal. Now, if we don't get an acquittal, and if I am found guilty, then um, we've thought about the consequences, and it would mean that potentially I'll be in, in prison for three months. Um, but I think it's just such an important issue, and such a uh, it has so many implications for many, many members of society that it's something we feel is, is worth taking the risk for. Um, the implications will impact on journalists that are carrying material through borders, um, information about their sources. Uh, the implications will impact um, lawyers carrying evidence, uh, legally privileged material. It will impact uh, doctors, teachers, psychologists, anyone who has any contact with members of the public and carries confidential information about them. I mean, it will even impact like businessmen. You know, you've got, you've got detail about your company, your partners and so on. Bankers, um, they'll have client information or customer details. All of this, um, really, the police right now have the power to gain access to all of that information without giving you a reason. So we're trying to make those points publicly and to try and say um, that the uh, ramifications of this case are actually quite far-reaching. And, and lastly, um, there's a specific point for the, for the, for the, for the Muslim community um, in the UK and in the West probably generally. Um, the Muslim community are cast as a suspect community, um, sadly. That's how the narratives around Islam and Muslims have been generated and sustained by authoritarian tendencies within uh, Western nations. And what we have identified is Schedule 7, as a power, legalizes this suspicion against Muslims. So it disproportionately impacts Muslims, number one. And secondly, it gives a lawful way of casting all Muslims as suspects. 
because there's no ground for reasonable suspicion um, to, to be, to, there's no sort of test for reasonable suspicion um, at the time when somebody's detained. So that's why it's especially important that we um, challenge this and even take that risk of um, landing in prison um, to, to try and uh, make a change. Mohamed Rabani, International Director of the Group CAGE, about to go to trial in Britain for refusing to hand over the password to his laptop. Mohamed, thanks so much. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.